Welcome to today's episode where I review highlights. This is where I review highlights I've read in the, I've made in different books while reading them and uh, articles and so on, but mostly it's it's about books. And uh, let's get started. The first one today is from The Leader's Greatest Return. People too often overvalue their dream and undervalue their team. They think if I believe it I can achieve it, but that's simply not true. Being alone is not enough to achieve anything. It takes more than that. Your team will determine the reality of your dream. A big dream with a bad team is a nightmare. I think there's not much for me to add on over here. Uh, the these few sentences cover everything that the author wants to say about how some people, uh, some leaders, overvalue their dream and thinking that okay, it's just because it's their dream, they can make it happen, and you know, not pay attention to the team at all. Or not care about the team, or like the author says, undervalue the team. So I, th- I think everything said. Let's move on. Remote, not distant. Every p- person is given their turn to speak, and the rest must listen. The re- facilitators invite quiet people to go first. Leaders and louder people always speak last, so they don't influence or intimidate others. This is a section where the author talks about in you know, how to run effective meetings. And uh, while the advice, I think it's kind of. Uh, sound for even in person meetings but in in remote environments you know when the meetings are held over calls these things are especially important to keep in mind and uh, it's very easy that you know one person um, stays silent for the whole call and um, does not get noticed at all so facilitators invite quite people to uh, go first making sure that everybody gets their voice in and uh, especially you know leaders and louder people speak last because uh, they tend to drown out all the other opinions. Uh, you know, there is this common saying, hippo, um, highest paid person's opinion. It's like like the name says hippo. It's uh, it, it kind of overrides everything else. So it's just uh, advice about uh, how to run meetings. Moving on. Kill it with fire. The subtext behind the phrase legacy technology is that it's also bad. Barely functioning maybe. But legacy technology exists only if it was successful. These old programs are perhaps less efficient than they were before, but technology that isn't used doesn't survive decades. This is a common, uh, uh, what's the word? Subtext? Okay, you know, it's a good word. It's a common uh, thought pattern as well that, you know, if something is legacy, you know, as soon as we label something as a legacy technology, it kind of means that it's bad. It's it's kind of like, it's, it's kind of implied that it's bad. Whereas the author makes a point over here, you know, the, technology survived all this time because it was good because it was successful not because it was bad yes there is a reason why uh, it might be considered uh, for a refactor for a rewrite whatever you know for a refactor Um, because they may be less efficient or the situation has changed or the you know the, the scalability factors have changed there may be many reasons why it has been considered for a refactor but the uh but like if we assume that uh, or if we begin looking at a piece of old technology for refactor by this mindset that you know that it is inherently bad because it is legacy we're not going to be successful at all i saw this video yesterday uh, where um, uh, uh, the the prime agent he's reviewing uh, some posts and he's reviewing this post about uh, somebody who has rewritten the software in go and um, he also applauds basically the whole uh, post motive that um, most refactors are most rewrites are bad. Uh, just because something didn't uh, doesn't work now, it doesn't mean that it's inherently bad. And um, uh, I, I think I'll link to that video over here. But um, yeah, essentially, it's um, the, this connotation. This uh, you know, whenever we hear the phrase legacy technology, and our mind in, immediately goes to something that's unusable or that's that's outdated. Outdated, sure, but um, that's bad. Uh, you know, that's something that we have to work upon. Because if you start with that mindset, we're not going to go anywhere with the with the efforts to refactor it, or or you know, uh, or we'll not reach success with our new uh, the new version of the software. Uh, I feel like I can keep going on about it, but uh, I think I'm just going in circles now, so I'll move on. Again, kill it with fire. At small organizations, we find people are doing several different jobs at once with roles not so clearly defined. Everyone in the same space is using the same resources. In short, small organizations build monoliths because small organizations are monoliths. 
this is a reflection of uh, conway's laws you know where uh, uh, the law states that software organ software systems mirror the uh, mirror the design of the organizations that uh, that build them so if it's a small organization that's building a software it tend to tends to be a monolith because the small organization is a monolith because people are doing the, the same job you know imagine a startup a small startup where every role is not very clearly defined uh, you know you have to step up to the uh, to the need of the hour whatever is required you step up and do it it may not be in your job description and monoliths are kind of like that you know where uh, there are no discrete responsibilities uh, placed on different actors it's it's just one system that's doing everything so yeah it, it's a, it's a reflection of conway's law like i said remote not distant uh, again don't rush to provide a solution just listen people can learn more from their own experience than from your advice processing past even helps us reflect on what we can do better next time i am not really sure of the context of this but you know it's good advice you know just listen that's one of the most important traits of any leadership or any team activity just listening in um so people can learn more from their own experience than from your advice i think that's the key phrase here moving on the leader's greatest written i think all the books are being repeated today <laughs> A company's culture is the expression of the values of the people within the organization. It is the sum of the behavior of the people, not a reflection of what you want it to be. People do what people see, and they keep doing it. What people do on an ongoing, habitual basis creates culture. So uh, it's effectively saying that you can't intentionally create a culture. What you can intentionally do is uh, demonstrate certain behaviors, certain values, and um, and, and encourage everybody to. imbibe those values or reflect those values in the daily uh, day day to day actions day to day tasks think about those values think about those principles or behaviors and the sum of the behavior of the people over time that is what leads to a culture right you know you as a leader of whatever stature cannot go into a team and say that okay this is the culture of the team and you know make it so it doesn't happen that way it happens with your own behavior starting with your own behavior your own actions uh, uh, what does it say over here people do what people see and they keep doing it so what people do on an ongoing habitual basis creates culture so what do they see they see what the leaders are doing and so basically the leaders personal values they kind of spill over in the team's values as well and because of course a leader lot of the leaders action would be driven by their personal values so um this is how it leads you know like the leader's personal values spilling over into the work and into the team and you know the team uh, imitating this um, imitating seems like a derogatory word over here but i don't really mean it that way it's 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 natural that you know people will uh, uh, people will do things that uh, that get them seen in a workplace so if a leader is doing that it's natural to uh, assume the people will also follow the same things because they want to be seen in a workplace they want to be recognized in a workplace so yes and that is what creates a culture going on working backwards however restricting the length of the document is to use a term that came up with uh, came up in describing the narratives a forcing function we have seen that it develops better thinkers and communicators so uh, the, there are the different documents uh, being talked about in this working backwards i think this is being uh, this is the six pager they talking about when they want to propose new ideas they write a six pager and uh, it has to be six pages you know not less not more um, as in i'm sure it you know little less or more is fine uh, but the idea is that uh, not very less because the document should be comprehensive and not more because uh, then you know um, either the idea is too big or the author has rambled on about uh, about something so this is what the highlight is saying you know so restricting the length placing an upper limit of 6 pages is a forcing function because now the authors are forced to keep it concise uh, you know not ramble on and uh, it develops better thinkers and communicators like the highlight says going on range it gave me this template for seeing my career Virtually every good thing in my life I can trace back to a misfortune. So my feeling is you don't know what's good and what's bad when things happen. You do not know. You have to wait to find out. I think we all understand this that uh, you know we can't really judge an event by its immediate results in that uh, instant. 
it's um, you don't know what things what are the results going to be out of a what of a thing that you're going to label as good or bad so you don't know what's good what's bad until until the results come out you know you have to just wait to find out i think that's that's really about it so i, I don't know what context uh, this was in it's it's um, I, i can't recall that but again like as a standalone advice it still stands this one is from drive effort is one of the things that gives meaning to life effort meaning effort means you care about something that something is important to you and you're willing to work for it it would be an impoverished existence if you were not willing to value things and commit yourself to working towards them i think um i think the first part of this is perfectly clear that you know effort uh, effort gives meaning to your life you know if you don't if you're not really caring about something if you're not going to apply effort like you know what kind of life is it like it says it would be an impoverished existence if you were not willing to value things and commit yourself to working towards them so yeah you know whatever that thing may be for you moving on okay it's a long one well it's the last one as well stool and focus He believes that losing your daylight is the deepest form of distraction and you may even begin decohering. This is when you stop making sense to yourself because you don't have the mental space to create a story about who you are. You become obsessed with petty goals or dependent on simplistic signals from the outside world like retweets. You lose yourself in a cascade of distractions. You can only find your starlight and your daylight if you have sustained periods of reflection, mind wandering and deep thought. James has come to believe that our attention crisis is depriving us all of of all three of these forms of focus we are losing our light i think the core metaphor over here light and i can't really recall what is what this metaphor is for so um it's a little difficult to relate although not not to the advice itself uh, you know or not to the point of the highlight itself the metaphor yeah i can't re- really recall but the point of the highlight that um, you know if we um if you're focused on like petty things like goals or uh, simplistic signals or you know th- th- these are all symptoms of this attention deficit culture that we live in, live in nowadays where um, you know this video of 12 minutes is considered too long so uh, it's it's difficult to pay attention i'm not saying that you know my videos are a must watch but uh, what i'm saying is that it's 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 generally unreasonable to assume people will watch a video that's uh, you know 13 minutes long like you know which is what it's running right now so um yeah it's um it's it's yes you know i, I think like the highlight of the way says everything and the key part metaphor i'm afraid i can't really recall it right now which means that uh, i should really just move on and uh, that's the end of the highlights today thank you for watching yet another one of this and uh, yeah have a good day